Womanjika, come to a, come with a purpose to our beautiful home, the lands of the two great bays, Nam being Port Phillip Bay and Merrin being Western Port Bay. My name is Carolyn Briggs. I'm the elder of the Yalikut Willem of the Bunwurrung language group, and I'm representing here my community and my ancestors and RMIT. That's my other family. We are here today on the lands of the Illuk Willem clan of the country of the ancestors and we pay our respects not only today but all, always to all our ancestors of those people who came before us. But it's also about celebrating you tonight coming and braving this part of the area of Melbourne which is very cold. But this has made this city bigger now. So they've extended it. It used to end up way up that part of the world. This area was totally different to what I know, what it is now. And as a family of the uh, Bunwurrung of the Yalikawillam clan, Melbourne's first people, I'm pleased to be able to welcome you all here tonight. We are very especially pleased to recognise your commitment you have made to be here tonight in paying respects to the spirit of the land and its, to its first people. And tonight we acknowledge the Yalikut Willem country and this country is unceded land. The Bunwurrung are the custodians of the land that stretches from the Wilson's Promontory or Wamoon to the mouth of the Werribee River which we know as the Yalikut Willem country. And, and it's also about, in compass, about our two beautiful bays known as Western Port and Port Phillip. It is important for all Australians and fellow countrymen to understand and appreciate the history and the culture of the First Peoples of what is known as Melbourne. The struggles to preserve our culture and our cultural heritage, but also our traditions began with our ancestors in the 1830s. And the, one of the lessons that we should take from this struggle was the way that it, the elders and leaders of the day forged an alliance that led to many of the achievements that sometimes we take for granted today. Our elders are still here today, 186 years later, and it is a continual discussion with all of communities. As people of this place, we now know as Australia, but also while we have may have descended from different clans and different language groups and from countries all across the world, we should support our elders' rights for the voice to government and our rights to truth towards a treaty, and particularly in this country. The word Womanjikas translates comes with a purpose. The action come, ask to come, and what is your purpose or what is your intention? It also is a contract between people as the custodians of the land and yourselves to ensure the laws of Bunjil, our creator, are adhered to, and not also to guarantee safe passage to all those who ask. And according to our traditions, our lands will always be protected by our creator, Bunjil, who travels as an eagle and by Wan, who protects our waterways, travels as a crow. Bunjil taught us the responsibility that we have to adhere to is the law of the land, or Warungi Bik, to ensure that we protect our Warnies, our waterways. Also, he required us to ask all guests to make a number of dumbbells or dumbbells or commitments, not to harm our Big Biks, our lands, and not to harm our Warnies, our waterways, and particularly not to harm Bunjil's children, our Bubbles, 
And if you accept these commitments through the exchange of a small bow dipped in the water of the land, this will guarantee a safe passage as you travel through our many landscapes. And we also hear about the law of Jambana. This law speaks of community, the importance of community. And the Yalakut Willem people of the Bun of the Eastern Kulin understood the power of diversity and that within our lands increases our capabilities. It was always good to share stories of different experiences. However, they understood how to use, utilize this very powerful tool. They had to identify a common purpose. And what do we have? What are the things that we have in common today? Finally, the last law is the connection of country. We might call honoring sacred ground or paying Gilbrook respect to the people and the land, the people who took care of the land before us the people who lived and died on this land before we were here. We are paying respects to the stories, the histories of land on which we live today. We are fortunate to have 80,000 years of human history and it is important to pay respect to that history not only while you're here or at work or at home. And if you adhere to these Warongi Bigs, I say in the words of my ancestors once again, Wamanjika, Marambikbik, Bunarom, Namdeb, Barupton, Arthur Willem. We all come with a purpose to our beautiful home. Nungujun. Nungujun is that I acknowledge that you are here in place. Thank you, Auntie. And what we're talking about today is play about place. And um, although place is, um, comes with all of these serious layers of history and, and connection and uh, ways of, of, of being in the world, and it's kind of really loaded with, with um, meaning, you might say, well, why are we talking about play then? You know, that is kind of something that's fun, that's trivial, it's, it's kind of not really serious. Um, well, we're talking about play with the imagination, how we can see public space as a space for collective play, collective imagining of possible worlds. Uh, and so to the to conversation tonight is really um, led by uh, uh, Auntie Carolyn and um, uh, her indigenous knowledge, but bringing that into a conversation with other uh, knowledge systems, other ontologies, other kind of ways of being um, so I'm going to start by introducing our, our speakers uh, and um, also uh, thank M Pavilion for this wonderful space and, and uh, 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 the program of events that's on, on going on through the next couple of months and RMIT University uh, 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 who have supported this event along with Playable City Melbourne. Um, but first let me introduce uh, Jock Gilbert who is sitting uh, to my right here um, and here's... Uh, also based, he's based at RMIT University and he's a registered landscape architect with expertise in community engagement and indigenous-led research. Uh, his work brings together community engagement, regenerative practice and indigenous-led design research focused around the development of green infrastructure uh, through the convergence of concepts of place, country and landscape. So again, bringing together different knowledge systems. Um, I'll also introduce uh, Professor Sarah Beckersey, who is on this screen here. So um, she was going to be here in person, but uh, her son has just had a COVID test, and so we're playing it really safe, and um, she's effectively in quarantine. So she's at home, um, you know, uh, I guess it's 2020, and anything can happen. You've got three people in person and one on a laptop. So um, I'll just introduce uh, Professor Sarah Beckersey, and we've patched her into the sound system, so her voice will be kind of booming through. Um, 
Uh, she is also at RMIT University and um, looks like we're all going to be fighting the wind tonight. Um, and she is, uh, leads the Icon Science Research uh, Group at RMIT, which uses interdisciplinary approaches to solve complex biodiversity uh, uh, conversa uh, uh, conservation problems. Um, and she's particularly interested in understanding the role of human behaviour in conservation and in designing cities to encourage everyday nature experiences through urban biodiversity strategies. So, you know, kind of literally, um, you know, kind of, well, actually, I'll, I'll leave it up to Sarah to critique this particular response to green space, but often really embedded uh, ways of, of bringing green spaces into the urban environment. And of course, um, you've met uh, Auntie Carolyn, um, who is uh, 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 joining us uh, tonight. Uh, Auntie didn't mention that she's uh, completed a PhD um, with, uh, 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 which kind of is particularly, so has particular expertise on this topic because the PhD topic was literally, because uh, was uh, focused specifically on bringing together old knowledge systems with innovative forms of practice. So how do we um, translate uh, these you know, tens of thousands of years of indig indigenous knowledge and culture into contemporary frameworks and, and she often describes herself as, as living between two worlds or two knowledge systems and, uh, and so we're, we're going to really be situating the conversation in that way of, of being tonight. Um, so to, to get started I'm going to introduce just uh, the topic of urban play uh, and uh, how, what it, how it's connected to this um, conversation to give you a bit of an idea of how we're going to run this, I've got a, a number of con uh, questions for our speakers. Um, we're going to uh, uh, kick off that conversation um, and around uh, kind of uh, the 15 minute kind of uh, mark when we're about, got, got about 15 minutes to go, we'll allow a bit of time for Q&A. So if you do have any questions that come up as you're kind of listening to everyone speak tonight, if you could hold on to those and um, uh, kind of uh, we'll have time for that at, at the end. So let's get started on this topic of play about place. Because we're here really to talk about public space and the role that we all have in our uh, different ways of, of in, you know, in our different ways of shaping that space, its values, its experience, that, uh, and its structures and our ways of being within it. So really, I guess, when we're talking about knowledge, the idea that that knowledge and our, our values, our kind of customs, our, our kind of ways of being, um, shape the space that we live in. And this is particularly true in cities and particularly true um, in public space. A large part of this conversation involves reconciling different disciplines and ontologies, betw being between knowledge systems and holding multiple worlds in mind at once. Collective world building. While this kind of world building, while the kind of world building we're familiar with may be that of our, our kind of our cities, constructed worlds of you know, concrete, glass, steel, um, and as we've heard in Auntie Gar Carolyn's inspiring welcome to country, um, you know, there are kind of deeper collective forms of practice that have been part of this place for tens of thousands of years. So there's other, you know, other ways to shape place that um, are embedded in this, uh, uh, where, this city that we're in right now. So urban play explores ways of being in public space that present methodologies for collective world building. And this is the type of thing that we're really talking about. You know, this is, you know, guided by understandings of place and of, of how people play. You know, one of the uh, uh, kind of really early play scholars um, kind of said that play precedes culture. So that literally play is the way that adults figure out ways of being in the world. So literally, uh, so, so how, how, you know, that our cultures come through, through, um, through play. Uh, so, uh, and, um, and of course these cultures harden into things like cities. And then we take them for granted. We say, oh, this is just the way the world is. The way how all, all this around us is just how things are. But that's not necessarily true. And I think that uh, this year, you know, with this particular moment, with the pandemic, and now we're talking about being in a kind of post-pandemic moment, you know, post-lockdown, we're kind of rediscovering the city. Um, and we're kind of, you know, there's this discussion of returning to a new normal um, or kind of returning to whatever was normal before. The point being that when you start to kind of 
go into this imaginative uh, uh, kind of form of, of play and, and kind of questioning and curiosity and imagination, um, you don't take those things for granted. You don't say, well, this is just the way the world is. It could be something else. And this year, this uh, uh, 2020, with uh, the um, uh, impact of the pandemic and, and of, of um, you know, kind of this moment of reflection, there's a lot of things that we want to forget about this year, but there's also a lot of things that we want to remember. You know, this moment of pause, this moment of reflection, this moment of seeing things differently, the mo this kind of moment of... Um, chaos, <laughs> where, uh, um, you know, things are falling apart, and I still need these notes, I was just going to throw them away, but actually, no, I still need them. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you. You won't know. Um, so, so what I'm, uh, uh, we're just uh, kind of picking up on that theme of of, of where we are now. So we have this, this moment where we can see things differently and it's going to go away very soon because we're kind of all, of the aspiration is to return to how things were. We have this moment, kind of brief, uh, uh, kind of uh, perhaps the next year, perhaps the next couple of months where we can play with public space, play with imagining how the world could be, play with possibilities, play with, um, uh, and, and play in the way that adults play. Um, perhaps when you were coming here, you thought, oh, it's going to be one of those play workshops where the, you know, the speaker's going to start throwing things around and you're kind of jumping up and down and asked to do all of this really active play. The type of play that we're talking about here is contemplative, reflective, um, quiet, introspective play, the kind of reimagining of the world. It's a kind of way to reconnect and reimagine the world around us. And so really that's the conversation that we'd like to have with you tonight is this uh, uh, um, what can, we, what can we do with this particular moment now? How can we uh, collectively build, uh, this is going to sound really kind of um, optimistic because it is, collectively build a new world? And of course, the invitation to Auntie Carolyn is to lead us into that process, to kind of find uh, a new way that we could build and be and, and, and play in public space. So with that um, lofty goal in mind, uh, let's start off the conversation. <laughs> um, so kind of, thank you, Jock. Um, you know, we're, we're starting the conversation by reflecting on um, First People's connection to place, um, recognizing that this is a fundamentally different way of being in the world. Uh, so we're gonna start with this question of, you know, how could this knowledge shape our shared future um, through how we live and play in cities. Um, Auntie, do you want to start us off? Yeah. <laughs> well, being born here, I was born in Melbourne, so I had to think about how I remembered Melbourne, but I also had to think about how I, I think about my place in this world that I can't find myself. There's no markers around to remind where my ancestors were. But there was old diaries and I had to think about stories. I had to think about how my, my mother told me stories. But you, as when you're a child, you, it's a story. And it's also about oral history. But it was understanding that oral history that had a major impact on me growing up. And it was about reflecting on the strength and of our old people, but it was also acknowledging that we do talk about this pandemic, but we, we have to reflect and think there was an ice age here 20,000 years ago. And it, it demonstrated a survival, an adaption. People adapted to change, went to different parts of this world here. And then we had to go through the impact of sealing and whaling industry that had a major impact just before the colonisation, that early period of taking resources from us. We adapted to that. 
And then there was the next wave, the impact of gold, another way of taking resources from us. But also the land was taken as a, as a major economic base because it's land was your resource. It was your food source. It's the way you navigated around the waterways. It's the way you hunted your food, you gathered. So it was about being adaptive to that process as well. And how did we survive? It's 186 years since the last impact of that early colonisation that removed us from the place that we connected to. So it's about stories, it's about survival, it's about being what everybody put it under the caption of resilience. But I would now argue that it's under anti-fragility. We were able to know how to talk, share ideas, celebrate, move around, negotiate, moving through different people's countries, adapting to different languages. So it's all about what I think in that was play and negotiating and being resourceful. Even in the city today, I negotiate memories of laneways and think about how I can negotiate and remember where all these places are, that I was still the child that's finding the path of where can I fit? And it was like understanding major events that occurred in Melbourne in that early impact of colonisation. The negotiations that went on with my ancestors, with the early settlers. And that's where, where the partnership came and understanding that I needed the tools of our Western systems and I had to learn how to use a GPS <laughs> so I could map coordinates and where these places were that made sense to my place in this world now and how I can put these markers up and remind me that a certain event had happened at a certain time in negotiating for rights to country. And they went back in, back in the 1840s where the, certain events took place, that negotiating for our rights to country. So it wasn't a young uh, a activism. It was activism going on from the early impact of colonisation. Also a negotiation. We learned to adapt to negotiate. We learned how to uh, survive or we wouldn't be here. Um, and so this city, I think about it now and how this part of the world has totally changed in my landscape of what I know about my Melbourne. And, but I found all this evidence in records of my old diaries that gave me sense of what my ancestors were telling the early settlers that gave me a stronger sense of how I fit within this Western world. So that's something I have to understand. Yes. And I play. I learn to play with technology. You play. Understanding country. Even if there's big buildings that overwhelm me. But certain areas I can uh, navigate through and I can sit with it and reminds me of where people went and how they moved around this amazing matrix because it was built on the grid. And that's learning how to negotiate through play. So knowledge is encoded into place. Oh, very, very much so. But mm. if, it's, if it's only stories, it's about stories and it's about the importance of those stories and then making sense of those stories as you grow up older but it's also how I can make markers within certain areas that will remind me that I still exist in place. Yeah, I, I like the multiplicity of the of the in, of, in the way that you use the word markers, and um, because this is something that comes up in 
landscape architecture as well, how you mark and, and construct place. And and um, thinking, Jock, if you wanted to talk about uh, in in response to this, perhaps how in, in did an indigenous-led design practice could shape the city or public space or landscape differently. Thanks, Troy. That's a, some undertaking. <laughs> no pressure. But thank you. Um, and thank you, M Pavilion. Thanks, Troy, for the opportunity. Um, and thank you again for reiterating that wonderfully generous welcome, Auntie. Thank you, as always. Uh, I never... I hear it differently every time, and I think that's a that's a wonderful thing. I, hear, I take something new from it every time, so thank you. It's learning to write it. <laughs> it was never written, so when language has never been written, you have to key into codes again and, and put them into a structure that, you know, that's using Western knowledge mm. to systems. Mm. Um, I think what's been incredibly powerful in my journey along this path has been your bringing to my consciousness this idea of the welcome, Womanjika, uh, the, the coded injunction to state your intention that's held within that. So there is a, there is a question that, that demands attention to an obligation to, to provide that intention. And in many ways that that question, uh, you know, can become life's purpose, really, and, and in a sense it does. So um, I would like, in, in response to the welcome, I would like to acknowledge, thank you, and um, acknowledge the people of the Bunwurrung language group on whose land we are gathered today, whose unceded land. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the people of the Wathorong uh, nation on whose land I live uh, and with my family. And also um, the people of the Barkindji Nation, with whom I've had the great privilege of, of also learning and sharing a journey, also partly with Auntie Carol in some of those intersections. Um, and I would like to acknowledge the, all of the ancestors, past, present and emerging. And, and a lot of this we can say kind of quite, you know, it rolls off our tongues now because we, we know, we have a sense of where we're going, but it's, it's extraordinarily powerful um, to do so. Um, I, I, I think I'll probably slightly diverge uh, or, or just go back a little bit, Troy, but my, my life story started in a place called Alice Springs, actually, and uh, um, one would think that that would have been steeped some way in, in a knowledge of um, Indigenous culture and, and Indigenous ways of being. Um, but, of course... Uh, I won't tell you what decade that was, but um, it, was, uh, it, it wasn't so. So I came to the practice of landscape architecture in the middle of my life and was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to start to think about this thing called landscape and um, went in search of that, really. And the search for that... Um, a little bit like Joe Biden. Um, the search for that... <laughs> developed into uh, the term that you just used a lot, Auntie, which was negotiation. So I found myself um, describing my sort of research practice as that of negotiation and, and um, the Latin root of, of negotiate is, is the, really the means anything but work. So it is leisure, it's play, um, it, is, it is an action through which, uh, or through which we undertake we, we look for an outcome, but we're not considering ourselves or being considered to be working, so we're not in labour. Um, and as I said, that, that initially started as a search for landscape in Western New South Wales. What, what is Australian landscape? And, you know, uh, it became apparent that, that there was another story that, that I really had spent half my life not seeing, and that was the story of First Nations people, and that was in that sense was the story of the Barkindji people and the Barker, the Darling River, uh, and the concept that that river cannot be separated from those people, from the people. And Auntie has a very similar story of water here and the inability um, 
for Aboriginal people to think of a separation between water and land and for us to be able to think of ourselves being separated from this thing that we call landscape. So um, what, what I event or kind of came to after, you know, um, several years of trying to employ our Western technology in that search, realising that what I was actually doing was looking for my own place. So in a very similar, similar but different way to what Auntie's described, her place in her own place and the dislocation to that, understanding my place in the story of that dislocation. So I had four bears who were, they weren't sealers and whalers, but they, were, they profited handsomely from the gold trade. They, they became landed. And so that has an implication for me, the way I think and be in the world, but also the way I practice and my, um, the, the way I present myself to this thing called landscape. So it's fundamentally, I think, our, this place is made up of our own places and our places within it, so locating ourselves. And I find now... I'm old, I can't use G, uh, GIS and GPS. I'm, I'm not really proficient in, um, in Western technology, but I did find that I had to relearn a set of protocols as to how to engage with indigenous knowledge. And that actually helped me to find my place and to be able to place myself within relationship to that original place story, which, um, has changed my life really. So I'm able now to understand um, in a way that is not saying you know, I know because I am also the introduction, I'm a, a non-Indigenous landscape architect. So what's the implication for me as a non-Indigenous landscape architect practising in a discipline that is arguably an instrument of colonisation in a colonising society and what's my place in that? And how do I, how do I find a place to operate in that? And I think um, Troy's conception of play offers us a way to think about that. And, and you know, we have often thought about the cultural interface, this, this space in between, as Artie talks about. Um, and we can think about that as a play of systems. There's two systems that we think of them as rigid and tight, but actually we can find our way in little cracks. And we, if we're we remain open enough to that place, we can find ways to operate. And it is playful. And um, it's just a joy to spend time with Auntie. If, and and um, the playfulness is uh, quite extreme. <laughs> and so in, in negotiating that terrain, we are actually, I think, playing. And um, I think it's wonderful for, for Troy to pursue that as how that plays out in public space. So there's a, there's a kind of broader question, I think, in terms of um, the notion of public and publicness in relation to Australia, I think, in, in uh, a kind of larger issue, that we might be able to direct public space towards an, a greater understanding of that issue, I think. Yes, certainly. I, I know what you mean by those um, mind-blowing moments because uh, the first time that um, Auntie and I talked about being in two places at once, it was really uh, you know, one of those, I guess, like you said, moments of where the whole world just shifted right in front of you because standing here anywhere in this city where you're standing in two places at once, literally, even if you take it from the point of view from a legal framework, there's two sovereign nations that, that are coexisting in the same space and um, uh, and that that's a really powerful uh, conception to 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 hold in your mind or really challenging conception to hold in your mind but once it's once it's there it really does shift uh, your perspective and and um, uh, yes yeah, so, um, thank you for, for well, that. I, I also think about the little people I work with now little yeah. ones. And I, I tell them stories and they learn to illustrate those stories. But the, the person said to, I wasn't that be able to be travelling down there all the time, so it was on tapes, um, my recordings. And what, they said, why do you lay down every time you hear Artie's voice? They said, 
because Artie says we've got a dream and we've got to dream how we can design the story. Oh, there's my grandson. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> That's my grandson. Dawu. Perfect timing. Right on cue. Well, speaking. That is also a graduate at RMIT too. Perfect. Been. Um, <laughs> this is family's well, come to listen. Well, uh, well, speaking speaking of little ones. Um, uh, so it is important that we can children play and they discover, and they discover about everything in their environment, and they learn that it's not to be afraid but to play and challenge it and explore it. And they say, Auntie said we've got a dream. So they dream and create the stories. So Yes, for, for children, play is almost like work because it's learning about the world. And this is where, where it's powerful for adults as well because it's a, a, a way to, it's a methodology for, mm -hmm. for, or, uh, to, to come to understand the world. And the types of worlds that we're talking about, of course, um, Jock, you, you highlighted the connection between um, indigenous people and water, and um, I think we, we might um, uh, ask Sarah to perhaps comment on on some of these themes around um, perhaps what you might um, um, describe as our problematic relationship with nature and how that might might change and ways in which to do that, even with little people. Thanks, Troy. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Perfect. Yes, very good. Okay, well, terrific. Well, a thousand apologies for not being there uh, in person. I was actually really looking forward to <laughs> not giving a Zoom talk for once and uh, and also um, to, to be present with my fabulous RMIT colleagues uh, who I have respect deeply all around me here. On, I think I'm, I'm in between them on the, <laughs> on the chair here on this laptop. Um, I see play as a... What happens really when you're enchanted with a place, whether you're an adult or a child? And I think, you know, if I wanted to encapsulate what I try and do in my work, it's really about trying to re-enchant city people with nature through design. And, and in part, that's really about encouraging, you know, play in the city. Um, and I, I think a really, a really formative event that happened to me when I was, Sort of, I think I was pregnant actually with my first child and I was walking down Faraday Street. Uh, it was at the time when um, Brunetti's is on Faraday Street, if you know where I'm talking about there, uh, near Ligon Street. And, you know, it's extremely urban part of Melbourne. And a grandfather was there with, with, uh, with his um, quite maybe 18-month-old child who was just, just crawling kind of, you know, um, maybe trying to stand up, but she, she sort of escaped from him and went straight to this little patch of gravel that was surrounding a tree planted on the, on the pavement. And it was a really, you know, pretty kind of um, crappy tree and a, a sort of really depressing pile of gravel. Um, but she was enchanted. <laughs> and she was scrabbling around in this gravel and I think she found, like, miraculously an insect, maybe it was a millipede or something, and was was kind of you know picking it up and was giggling and it, it, I looked at that scene and I just thought, oh my goodness, we have to do better. You know, this is this is just a, an inkling of what you can achieve if you actually design your streetscapes to allow people to be enchanted. And so that's what I really have dedicated a lot of my kind of uh, of, of my career to now is to thinking about how we use design to build everyday nature experiences into people's lives. And to be honest, I don't think there's been a more profound demonstration in Melbourne <laughs> of what happened during lockdown. And, and we all know this. There were people who had nature on their doorsteps or in their backyards or just close by when they could access it. And there were people who didn't. And they were worse off mentally, physically, in every way, shape and form. And it's become a kind of real recognition, I think, in this city that it's it's a basic human right to have access to nature. Uh, it's environmental justice. And there's another aspect to this, which is having everyday nature in a city 
is a way of reconnecting Melbourne with our, and we need to be proud of it and celebrate it, but our wonderful, you know, Indigenous history and culture. Uh, and this is a, this is something that I'm 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 really proud to be part of uh, in terms of some research projects that really think about how we have urban caring for country, how we celebrate the return of species through our efforts, you know, as citizens and and together sometimes with our with our government partners to return species to the city. Working with the city of Melbourne at the moment to try and help them identify a species that they want to bring back to the city. And wouldn't it be wonderful to have species like um, the unfortunately named common brown butterfly, which sounds really un unappealing, but it once used to emerge at one of the start of one of the seven seasons, wondering seven seasons, and in huge numbers, and it would signify the start of that season. Now, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to have back and an enchanting thing to have back in our city, a reflective thing and I think a thing of play in, in essence? be able to reflect on the nature that belongs in this place and, and how it connects with our everyday lives and just and makes everything, you know, better. Roy, that's my five minutes, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So you're talking about um, the Totem Species Project, is that...? Um, yeah. That's one of the species, that's yeah. one of the projects that we're involved in. That's a really exciting project that we've, we're just kind of... Um, uh, reporting on now, but we, we worked with a school in Melbourne who and, and the traditional owners of, of, of that land in which the school is occupied um, to, uh, to, and the traditional owners gifted a totem species to that school and the school children learnt about the, the ecology and the, and the conservation of that species, how to create habitat for that species and they grew a garden for that species. They learned about the cultural aspects of that of that species and and how it um you know and how how kind of a relationship with a totem is really different to the way that we think about conservation in Western science. In that you know there's a mutual relationship. You look after that species and it's going to look after you. It's a really much more um, I suppose spiritual link to to nature than um, than we normally teach our students and they, they miss out if they don't get that, that knowledge. Um, so the, 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 the motivation behind the project was to try and develop a, a program that would um, develop cultural awareness in, in children uh, in schools uh, and then also a deeper connection to nature and a, and a respect for nature, I suppose. In, in part, it stemmed from my um, kind of horror, in a way, of having children at school uh, and then bringing back, bringing home the material that they're learning about and appreciating that they were learning about as much of, about Indigenous culture as I was as a child. And that was an embarrassingly poor amount. Uh, and I just, I just I put my foot down and said, I, I can't, this is not good enough. We need to do better in this country. And, you know, first to, to kind of obviously... Um, engender, you know, respect for culture in our children. But second, because why deny our children this incredible kind of, you know, body of knowledge, as Andy Caroline said, 80,000 years of, of knowledge and an understanding of our country that we are just kind of denying our, 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 uh, our students access to. Um, so that was what really motivated the, the, the project. But it's been a wonderful success and I, I really hope it can be used as a model to sort of see how we can roll these kinds of projects out in schools. Yeah, the um, uh, connecting with the more than human is it's is so important. I, it, it actually just made me think about something that happened last night in our front garden. Uh, 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 where there's a tree full of rainbow lorikeets uh, nearby, and one of them landed in our front garden and was no longer able to fly. Uh, and so we, my, myself, uh, I was watching this rainbow lorikeet for a while with my daughter and, um, of course, started to notice all of the birds. You know, there's been so many new birds in our street this, this year. Uh, the, you know, t it's uh, a, a kind of, you know, just having a, a, a street that's quiet um, means that, you know, suddenly all the animals start coming back. Um, we ended up, uh, you know, called it calling wildlife rescue and trying to get this bird into a box and, and took it to, to, to the vet to, uh, for them to take care of because an hour later it still couldn't get off the ground. But 
you know, in that, in that moment where uh, we were watching this bird and watching all of its, um, I guess, uh, 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 family gathering and other trees forming this kind of like triangular shape of protection because there were a couple of other minor birds and crows kind of coming into the mix. It was, it was um, yeah, like being, being in another world, in another kind of way, way of being. And, and uh, um, uh, I, I wonder if, if, if there's ways to, to kind of bring us back into these, these types of experiences, Auntie, um, you know, this kind of like connection to, to, the, to the more than human, um, which, you know, has been something that I know you've told a lot of stories about, about eels and how they, you know, kind of... Um, which you know, I'm working on at the moment. Um, we're going to be telling that story. And then I realise there are like... You were talking about plants and butterflies or a particular um, butterfly that appears at a certain season. But there's also a plant that appears when, or we note it, when the eels are running and when the eels could be eaten. <laughs> and it's the cherry balat or the barley, which is it's a, like a little cherry that the nut grows on the outside and it would be an indicator when we could know that the eels were running. Um, we're doing a project because somebody saw a story that I've written about the journey of the elk. Elk, we call it elk. Um, and now it opened up so many other stories about that eel and that journey of, of the eel and how I used to prepare it in my restaurant so that people would experience the wonderful flavours. But it's also about when we know a plant could indicate when the fish is running. It also tells us when we... things that... It's about environmental, I think, in that we use seasons or when birthing, when animal meat is in its birthing cycle. We cannot eat it. We also know when the fish is spawning, we can't have fish. So we had to understand how we use the resources of our land. And we can't do that in a, a supermarket unless they write it up now. So we only had like our emus and kangaroos, what were the things of the meat resources that we had before settlement. Sheep got better. But um, it's those things that also ate our resources out too. So we had to compensate. And I found that we started eating potatoes because it was the same sort of plant that grew out of the ground and it became a starch product, which a mernong is. So you've heard a lot about mernong. So we were able to adapt and learn different ways of um, experience food and flavours. So it's those sort of things. Everything, nature informs us. Design, nature can be through design. I've been lucky enough that I've just finished, when I finished my book on language, someone's picked it up in architecture and have designed a whole school on my book. So it's, it will fully immerse these young children into the first people's stories, from the preppies right down. So when those little people walk out of that school, they will not have to go and research. They will have a, a, an, a sense of understanding that they have a right to be in place. So I'm, it's, that's what design does, architecture, landscape. It also defines the way we see our world. So everything can inform us. I've been to other countries. There's roles and responsibility of understanding and appreciating those sorts of rules and regulations that guide people to tell, share stories about their country the foods of their lands, their cultural mores, and we try to respect that. 
But somehow there's been an amiss of all that and now we're trying to regenerate that knowledge so that helps people guide them. This looks like any other European city. Now we're learning to challenge it. Not everything has to be straight lines. It can be a Gaudi. <laughs> it can move. It can be expressive. So it's those sort of things that we're getting young people like yourselves could be more informed and, and start looking deep within yourselves because the answers are in you. We all carry generations of knowledge, you know, and these are the knowledges that we learn to play and express and understand how we fit in the world today and what are our challenges now because we're having to deal with so many complexities and lots of diverse societies that now are a part of our storyboard. But there's, we share a lot of commonalities too and a lot of purposes about human relationships. So that's something you need to think about. But there's no one answer. It's about, it's about the knowledge there's two ways of knowing. So they're the challenges. But not everything is one way, you know. We need to learn and challenge ourselves to open ourselves up to... There are lots of different ways people express their thoughts and their views and the, what they bring to this country. That is... It's been a part of my scaffolding of who I am today, made up of a lot of other things. Thank you. Yeah, I, I wonder actually if um, both um, Jock and, 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 and Sarah, your, your methodologies are, are, are generative and process-based and they're non-linear and they're about multiplicity. Um, and I know back, back, back in the day, I'm also not going to give the date, um, uh, <laughs> When I was at design school, it was certainly about very much about linear processes, a kind of like a logical, rational, constructive, a constructed process. Whereas um, uh, uh, certainly there seems to be a, a, a kind of a, an interest or a, or a recognition that these uh, uh, kind of regenerative processes are not only more productive in terms of um, you know, a kind of society, but also just from creative creative point of view as well. Uh, sorry, I can't see you there, Sarah, but I, I hope I'm not cutting in first. You're right. No, go for it, Doug. <laughs> um, and and really, uh, I think probably Sarah can give a kind of richer explanation of this. But the idea of interdependence and and uh, is is sort of critical to that, Troy. I think, and um, I think that the example of the what I know is the cherry ballot and and kind of was brought up with. I think that interdependence goes two ways. It, it, is both, it can be, you know, there's, there's a destructive element to it, but we can harness that as a regenerative process. So the Cherry Ballard that, that um, tell, told you when, when the eels are running and, and you know, when, when various things are happening, uh, I remember learning as a child that that also relied on the roots of the eucalypts that grew around it. And that's what we, we use it as a tool that says... It's like our children and we hope it never disconnects from us because that plant is a symbol of our children. So it's, it's that other... Uh, uh, well, then there's a deep learning in that for uh, yeah. us that not only is that a symbol of, what, of that independent, interdependence, it's, it's a reality of that interdependence. So if you, you can leave the cherry ballard and take out all the eucalypts and you lose the cherry ballard. So, but... Uh, Conversely, you can put eucalypts back into the right soil types and that produces the cherry ballard without, without us even knowing still really how to propagate a cherry ballard. And then I think if we go out of scale, um, at the moment that, the, that Melbourne, uh, that this NAM and this country was experiencing the Ice Age, where we are now, in driest, hottest western New South Wales, <laughs> around Lake Mungo, they were experiencing almost tropical, subtropical lushness. 
And so we can visit that place now and understand what happens when things change and we can understand that in a dystopian kind of mindset or we can take the, our cue from that and what happened and the civilization that existed there and learn adaptive mechanisms from that and, and design with that. So I think the, you know, one of the wonderful aspects of Indigenous knowledge is this um, kind of expression through metaphor and allegory that is rooted in a connection to elements of what we think of as landscape, but is actually country, uh, and that that demonstrates interdependence and the and the ways that that is both you know fragile, as you say, Auntie, but but also um, projective, you know, generative, it, it, and and it can be in design terms. Yeah, and and it is an amazing. You drive up and it looks like the Great Wall of China. Yeah. <laughs> you get in there, it's like a lunarscape. And then you can read the stars clearly and then you have to put up with the spirits. That's <laughs> to right. Inhabit that place, energy spirits, you know. And, and they're there. They even run ghost tours out there, don't they? Well, none of my Aboriginal friends have ever spent the night there with me. For that reason, but right. but you can also read them. time through those. Yeah, you can read time, yeah. and it was a, it was an amazing Willandra Lake system that dried up, you know, and you can't imagine something like that. And 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 the shifting of the sands has also shown us footprints that are so old, and the height of those people as they measured the stride, would be about eight foot tall. And um, Mungo man and Mungo woman. So it, the footprints are very large and uh, it's because of the uh, what was in the, the soil then that it was able to record those footprints. And as the sand shifts, through that landscape, it uncovers all sorts of things like fish ears. Um, also, uh, yeah, it's amazing just sitting there. And I found when I used to take students out there, because they're only working from a premise of their culture, their history, maybe 5,000 years old, and, and this was older than that, and they... They go through an extreme stress because they can't believe that sort of that that continuance of those stories. But the landscape is the storyboard. The people then generate this, uh, put a voice to it, create the narrative to it. So it, it's those learning to read country is like you would read your own memories. And it's that. And it's it's fun. And be exploring. It's being an explorer within yourself, you know. So is that a help? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't met this lady yet. So I'm sort of seeing her from the back. <laughs> it's not on this side. Thank you. Thank you, Jock. And it is an amazing place, isn't it? It gives you a moment and it's in that. It's only an hour at a Mildura, but it sort of gives you a, a real eerie sense of place. But there's amazing landscape that you, you would never find in other areas of the world. And that's why it's one of the wonders of this amazing country. So, um, Sarah, when I'm just thinking now with um, the, the practical side of, of, of building cities, one of the appealing elements of, you know, building things out of blocks is that they're really predictable. But we're talking about these really unpredictable, chaotic systems that are much richer than what you can build out of blocks. But what you, what you do a lot is um, talk with, uh, what, local government, um, urban planners, architects about embedding plants in buildings. You know, how do, how do they cope with that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, thanks for the question. I, I suppose, <laughs> I suppose, um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a I'm a kind of advocate of of you know the organic and 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 um, you know uh, 
kind of more sort of um, see, uh, let it evolve as it as it as it can type approach. But but I'm also I also think that we should be quite explicitly building nature objectives into the design of every single building and you know precinct that we kind of um, develop or redevelop or retrofit um, in in this in this city because it's it's too good a kind of benefit to 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 ignore. Um, and so, yes, let's be organic and creative and, and let it happen as it does, but actually let's be really kind of strategic as well about, well, what species do we want to see thriving in our street uh, and how do we make that happen? What are the resources those species need? What are the threats that would be posed to their persistence that we could actually design solutions to prevent those threats from happening? And how do we connect those streets to other streets or other parks and what have you to to really um, allow their their persistence. So yes, I think we need to design cities to have big parks and big, you know, riverside vegetation and the like. But what I'm talking about is the small stuff. It's about, you know, having having everyday experiences by having streetscape biodiversity. Biodiversity on the side of your building, on the top of your building, in your roundabout, in your courtyards and the CBD. You know, all of these places are, are kind of, and in schoolyards, they're all totally awesome opportunities for everyday nature. But can I quickly say something? I was talking about this with my daughter. This is one advantage of being at home and working. And we were sort of saying how, you know, there are so many barriers that people bring up instantly when you start talking about this. You know, what about them being animals being stinky or what about leaves in my gutters? And certainly in schools, there is so much discussion about safety. You know, and uh, the school that my kids go to, the janitor doesn't want sticks that aren't concreted into the ground because he's worried that people, that kids are going to pick the sticks up and wallop each other. Anyway, Zadie actually had a response to that. That's my daughter. And I just thought, could we quickly give her a tiny bit of airtime? <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> okay. Zadie, what's your reaction to, to Norm wanting to concrete the sticks into your school? Well, as a Come in. have nature in the so it's kind of disturbing to think that these adults in school places think that children are demons on rampages trying to destroy everything in sight. Because having a stick concreted into the ground isn't nature and it's not experiencing natural um, um, things and plants and animals in your schoolyard. And you can't do that unless people accept that sometimes having a stick on the ground, it may not be the safest thing in some way, but it's going to be good in the long run because if we have, if we grow up having schoolyards that have no nature and, and in it and places like that, then the parents of tomorrow are going to be teaching their kids that they don't need nature and it's a knock-on effect. So, yeah. Thanks, Amy. I couldn't really have said that better, to be honest. So thank you, darling. <laughs> Nor could I. Yeah, well said. Fantastic. Um, so, yeah, it's really uh, interesting to mix all of these uh, different worldviews, you know, just in the short space of this conversation. Um, in, my own ex in my own experience, uh, I started out um, making art effectively in a game design context. So I spent pretty much a whole decade in virtual reality inside digital spaces, constructing worlds, building digital ecologies, building you know, living systems out of computer code and so forth. And I had this moment where I came back into the city, this, the, this uh, kind of the world, I guess, as it was. And, and my perspective was completely different. It was kind of like, whoa. Uh, you know, growing up, it was very much like, oh, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a grass hill there and that's it. All you understand is a big kind of green kind of uh, hill and there's nothing else. But then you're know, coming back in after constructing all of these systems, it's like, oh, actually there's a whole ecosystem just in that hill. There's a whole process going on. Um, and so again, one of these moments talking with Auntie Carolyn that really blew my mind is that this was not a new idea. This has been something, though, a kind of a worldview that had been uh, in, in kind of um, in, in, in place for tens of thousands of years. And I think that particular kind of perspective on the world is is uh, 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 so um, 
a kind of um, uh, uh, kind of uh, it's kind of so uh, uh, kind of uh, different, but also at the same um, at the same time so connected uh, to uh, it allows you to become so connected with the world and with, with people around you that it's it, it really shifts your uh, kind of worldview um, uh, on an ongoing basis. You know, kind of every every day is different from that day on. So um, at this point in the conversation, unless Jock, you wanted to jump in and respond to to um, uh, uh, the the story we just heard about the playground at <laughs> Sarah's daughter's school. Um, we might open up for some questions before we finish up. I think questions would be much better than than I, I could talk all night. <laughs> let's go to let's go to questions. So, does anyone have? I think we've got a roving mic somewhere. Does anyone have any um, questions for Auntie Carolyn or Jock or or Sarah or even comments um, that, that come to mind as you've been listening tonight? This one down here. So I'm just going to make a brief comment. Um, so I've, I come from India and the city Mumbai. And when growing up, um, we lived in a, in a building compound and a whole lot of kids. And, you know, the center was concretized. And, and we still have a lot of fun out there. But Mumbai experiences a lot of rain and natural rain. And so the city floods up. And when the city floods up, what happens was, because there was... Um, this was about 15, 20 years ago. Um, I think the parenting was t style of people were, was a little more chilled out um, <laughs> in that sense, less policing. And I come from a country where governance is not that strict. So um, when it flooded up, what we did was we created our own game. We played some water soccer sort of systems with the natural, natural flood in the area, which looking back and hearing all the stories that this, I wouldn't even like think about it right now in that sense, but don't you think a lot of the restrictive ways we look at environment is because of our governance and our policies and our policing around? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I mean, this is, the, I think, uh, one of the points that I tried to introduce at the beginning is that you know the, the set of social values or the kind of collective world building that happens. Um, uh, which is tightly connected to governance uh, because you know, literally setting the rules about what you can and can't do in the world uh, is, is what produces um, you know, public space because we all go around with, oh, you know, well, you know, think about the most obvious example now is we're all re really sitting far from one another and this, is, this event is perhaps, you know, a hundred times more awkward than, than, it, than it would be um, without that kind of social distancing and, and all of those types of things. So, so you, you kind of become aware, and this is what I think is, is really interesting about play, is that um, it, it has this uh, capacity to, to allow you to see those points of difference and to, and to suddenly um, like have these kinds of moments that I'm talking about with, um, in conversation with Auntie Carolyn where suddenly you think, oh, this set of rules, this way, way of being that, that has been uh, part of my life for the past number of years, um, suddenly you, you, you kind of can see beyond it. It's like, I think you said the word matrix before, so it's, you know, I don't know if there's any fans of the matrix, but it's, you know, that time when you see, you know, you see through the matrix and you, you see the simulation, you see the, the rule set that's out um, in front of you. And, um, and that's what's really interesting for, to me about games and that kind of anecdote I told before about, you know, playing games and, and then looking at the world and seeing, well, yeah, there's rules in, in, in the world. And, and of course... For indigenous people, some of those rules um, have had serious consequence because yes. they've been imposed on you for yes. uh, your entire lifetime. Yes, and, and yeah. it's those things that we... I suppose that's probably why we really dealt with COVID because we knew the rules. We knew the rules that controlled us. We knew the rules that... But we knew how to navigate through those rules. And like you're saying in, in Mumba, I remember one of my students saying, I was teaching design anthropology, and he looked at me and I was talking about nature and he said, Auntie, we forgot nature. And luckily I'd been there and I thought, God, yes, it was Beijing. And he said, we forgot nature. And I thought, reflecting on that, 
there's nothing that can give them any th uh, connection to place because it's been – it's all these amazing buildings. You go there and you go, oh, five cities in one spot, you know. You're overwhelmed by all the design in that city and suddenly you'll see a little hutton somewhere in the back. But when he said that to me, he reminded me that that was the impact on – and that's why he loved the country, that he could be a part of something greater than himself, you know, that it reminded him that, you know, we need to have the environment, we need to have space. And that brings me to a point, if you're going to go to Melbourne City Council – They've got a new code out that they're building this building that's going to overshadow part of the Birrarung, the river. And they've asked me to put a submission in because there's lots of spaces around that developers want to take. And I said, no, it's, it's about the health and well-being of communities. These places should be, be informing the people and their opportunities to be a part of that place not another building on it. They don't need another building. They can go underground. No, they can. They need another... They've got a, every spare space they want to take and control and we've got to try and look at the section of the Act that can stop those impacts so that this, this big building that's going to overshadow the Birrarung and one of the things, what's it going to do to our ecology? How's it going? People love space. We know when it's dark and down certain streets and it's cold and windy like it is now. But you know what I mean? It's We need light. We need our cities to be open and give us lots of light and space and to be able to interact with our community groups. So it is about the health and well-being. So I could have a discussion with you, Sarah. <laughs> And we'll put a submission to the council. I'd, I'd really like to do that. Let's follow up. <laughs> Let's do a follow up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. With our planning people. I reckon we've got to let water in too. It, oh, I reckon a, we should unplug those yeah. trap waters that run under Boovery Street, right from Melbourne University, comes down to Elizabeth Street, down to Queen Street. That's where the eels travel to. And some of, get some of that hydrology flowing again. And I let think that people a, live around it. Yeah, that's right. And live with it. And, and I live think that with a, it, like you that said. Was a great and, and get to interact. Because I look at Mooney Mooney Ponds and we're saying unplug it, allow it to flow freely the way it was. Now it's trapped with everything in concrete. It doesn't look like the pond anymore. It looks like a. Gully, a drain trap. It is like a gully trap, yeah. And, and that courtyard in Mumbai, it's, it's almost as though it goes from being a landscape to being a place as the water comes up and then goes back again. And you make place that way. And we're very... Well, I am. A lot of us are. As landscape architects, we're cognizant of our place in flattening the world out and, and this terrible thing about... Everything has to have soft fall and, and, you know, we can't be more than uh, 900 mils above the ground with, a, you know, someone will get hurt. And so let that happen a little bit more. We, we you know, human beings make, through culture, make place and, and then the interaction with the animals. And I'm sure Sarah can give us the, the actual percentage, but I, I think there's something like 90% of biodiversity happens underneath the ground or in the ground and so it does like humans yep. they need water yep. <laughs> we saw that up in Will Kenya yeah, didn't we right. <laughs> that was pretty, pretty scary of the darling the barker yeah so these are the things we need to think about how people can control how you know the free flow of water, and and I think it was quite evident this year, earlier this year, wasn't it? Last year's, a couple of years, you know. So these are the sorts of things we need to think about: the free flow of water and 
allowing it to move through our landscape and learn to live with it. Yeah, and what you said before about finding and um, working with those pockets of, of land um, rather than letting them slip past, that uh, really characterises your approach. We were talking before about how every time a new system comes, confronts you, you decode it and, and, um, and make it your own, which is really uh, uh, kind of, um, highly kind of productive, both for, for those systems to be challenged in that way, but also um, um, for, for uh, yourself in, 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 in um, uh, I guess, uh, finding ways to, 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 to take some of these things back. Well, it to, is to, that to re -re way them. finding, isn't it, yeah. about ways of being in place, but also the opportunities of other communities or cultures that come in that can express being a part of memories, you know. Yeah, and that, that informs us, like what the lady from Mumbai was saying. You know, that's important to give us that reflection. And and that um, place is an ongoing construction, an ongoing process. I know, um, unfortunately, Olivia uh, couldn't join us tonight. But one of the points that she really wanted to make was um, how she's always struggling with. Um, the uh, you know, kind of benefits that have that have come from the colonization of this country, but at the same time trying to reconcile the impact of that um, and finding a, a, w a way to go forward where uh, uh, the, the, there's there's another there's another possibility there's another future which is um, somehow bringing those things together into and, and that was the opportunity of being able to. Exp create those narratives about my past and mm. my ancestors' past in through in doing my PhD, doing my PhD, <laughs> but a, a challenging the Western system as well because it was, a, a, it was informed by oral traditions. I know there's weaknesses there, but there's also a lot of strength in that. But also looking at Western systems have a lot of weaknesses too and addressing those issues. So there's two ways of knowing and I think that was the opportunity of having Olivia help me and uh, guide me through that process as well and allowing me to have that freedom to express it. Because <laughs> it was, it was, it's always a barrier, how do you challenge the Western system? And there are ways to do it. You know, not, not de de decolonising it but adding to it and re rebuilding it in another way. And with young potentials or our futures, we want to help help that. And whether people go back to their own countries or wherever, they can help inform with a stronger narrative of what they've experienced, that people do have voice and have the integrity of their own identities that informs them of their place. So I'm going to utilise Sarah. <laughs> and a really good example of that is um, how you work with technology um, so that even something like this mobile device, which is, uh, you know, you, you might not think of that as, as, a, as a site um, for, for Indigenous knowledge, but... A pop up elder. Yeah, but it, but it is a it is a way of of, <laughs> of bringing kind of place based learning yes. because it's something that we carry with us and it's a way to a, a tool for decoding the world. And it is, it, and I think that's what we were always conditioned to look up research and or look up other documents that inform us of different ways of thinking about things. But sometimes it's really good to come from the the creative narrative of the first people and knowing the story and creating a new storyboard within the, this myriad of complexities that we operate through now. Thank you. I know, I was just Complexity about to say, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm freezing. I know, <laughs> I can see it. And, and I'm um, three coats on. <laughs> I did not prepare for the Docklands. Um, even though I used to work here, I should have known, but I just, I've been inside my studio for 200 days or something like that. So getting out into the world is a new thing. Um, so I guess it, unless there's any further questions or final comments from, from anyone, we might um, um, leave it there. But first, if anyone wanted to throw in or... 
have a question? Was there a question? So I guess um, the last question we had, and also even Sarah's daughter talked about how we enable play perhaps by removing restrictions from kind of um, not acting or not preventing play. Um, I guess my question is also coming from a design perspective, what we can do to enable that, particularly in terms of um, when we are constructing that place in an ongoing fashion. Like if we look behind you, we see basketball courts, they have a design to them which has its own rules, which has its own kind of affordances that create, you know, codified forms of play. And I guess I'm wondering from your perspectives, particularly Troy and Auntie Carolyn, um, whether there are sort of things we can put into spaces, whether there are maybe infrastructures for the kinds of play you would like to see more of, um, or whether that's even kind of misguided as a designer that we can't design play because that's imposing ourselves too much. Instead, it's more about maybe creating space for people to find their own play. I guess maybe the simple question is, um, if you look behind you, would you want to put something else in place of the playground? Are there maybe different forms of playground that you would like to see, say, in Melbourne, if not here? Yeah, I mean, I, there's a couple of things there. First thing is, is permission. So, um, you know, and this is, you know, public space, we have all of these things about, oh, I can't do that, I can't do this, and, and um, oh, you know, people will laugh at me if I, I do that. That's what kids do, you know, or, or even just, um, uh, you know, different parts of Melbourne even have different permissions, like Docklands is a super constructed zone. Everything is in its place. There's not many things that are out of place, whereas, you know, you go down there into Collins Street and um, in the, uh, the city, it's much more playful. You know, things are here and there, they've just been kind of placed. They, uh, or, uh, and, and, and that happens organically. So it's about the kind of permission of a place. You know, what, what is allowed to happen there? You know, what are the, what are, and, and what can you do there? And, 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 and it's up to people to kind of challenge that. So I guess um, uh, uh, what, as a, as a designer of a city or as a kind of um, urban planner, a designing, a, a, a kind of a, a, another of our colleagues at RMIT, Quentin Stevens, talks about um, the kind of spontaneous play that happens. And so, so this kind of thing here, this is, again, super constructed play. And even earlier in the week when we were kind of preparing for this panel, we were talking about adventure playgrounds, <coughs> which originally started as um, a, a kind of repurposed kind of bomb sites after the Second World War, as just whatever materials came to hand, you'd build a playground and it, you know, safety didn't matter. There was no kind of guidelines on <laughs> what you could it build. It was safer than a bomb. That's, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so that's really that, that openness um, to um, play with the city itself. So not just build a little zone for play, but play with the city, play with the more than human, the, the animals, the plants, you know, but, um, the, seeing the whole I, world uh, as a playground. I see, see that with my grandson sometimes. He looks at the patterns in the street and, and he sees the numbers. And, he, and I, it sort of took me to a, another space because he could look at the numbers and he mapped it out and then he looked at different shapes within this city that gave me a nif different way of seeing from his perspective as a little person. So I think if we can just allow us that how we can navigate through these cities and explore them, and to bring that child out of us and, you know, because that child was felt safe within those boundaries so that they could explore the numbers and he could, he was counting numbers and what they meant to him exploring his new entry into primary school. So for me it was a good thing that he noted the numbers along where a car get parked. That gives you a fine. Um, those things, you know, and he was looking at the numbering systems. But it is, I, I, I see in Sydney some of the Indigenous people have been planting gardens on tops of roofs in, in um, Redfern. We took a group up there of designers to look at and the plants seem to be growing better up there than they are on the ground. Um, maybe no t too many dogs of that going around, but the, the plants have really done well up there. Uh, but it's also challenging and getting kids involved in touching and feeling and 
experiencing those things, experiential learning, but working with children to get them to understand their place in the school. So we used to do mapping and we'd use natural materials and they would design their, make a collage of their play, their place and understood what that represented to them, what was important about their school and what it looked like. So they designed it with leaves and stones and, and it was really good to see them explore their way of understanding their world at that period of time in school. So it is, children can inform you just by telling you and sharing a story what is special about their place. And I went to this little school, <laughs> it was out in one of the northern suburbs, a little Indian school. <laughs> And I said, we'll go and design their school so that they could tell me a story of their school. So we're putting this collage together and each special place that was sensitive to their expression of how they felt within that school. And I said, we didn't go to that place over there. I said, why didn't we go over there? And they said, there's ghosts there, auntie. And I said, oh, ghosts. <laughs> and I said, how do you know they're ghosts? She said, they're white. <laughs> and I went, because that's what we used to say about <laughs> non-Indigenous people when they come. Oh, they're the ghosts, you know, of the past coming back. And I just laughed because these little people said it as if it was so natural. They just said, oh, because they're white. <laughs> and I went, oh, okay. <laughs> so... But it was out there exploring and then when they did their collage, teachers love taking photos. Here's an old person working with kids. Click, click, click. And I said, turn that camera down on it. And they said, oh, my God, they've copied Aboriginal art. No, that's their design elements. That's their patterning using the natural materials. And that's how we used to do, or Papunya Tula does it that way, and what they call dotting art. But it really is a storyboard that informed you of the travels so that the ancestors could go home. And they had to remember that life story of that person. So it's like a eulogy. It's a remembering. Everything's about a remembering of where the water holes were. It's about expressing it through using the natural materials and it was demonstrated when you work with children. They're, they're not complicated that way unless we trap them into boundaries not to explore. So they're the things you think about if you're going to be working with children, allowing your own child in yourself to come out, explore those things. Design is challenge design. It's different. And it's also those elements of an understanding nature and how we fit within our environment as well. The big storyboard. I think it, it is about. I, I reckon there's something in that about the code. You know that the relationship of the codes and and. Um, the codes that are occurring in the in the fabric, and you know, the, like turf is is a kind of coded landscape element par, material par excellence, isn't it? Like, wh why couldn't that little rise be planted up in native grasses that kids can run through? And you know, I mean, it's um, we're 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 coming at it from one one perspective, which then becomes a habitat. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Sarah, did you want to um, add anything to that? Oh, I just think the whole conversation has been utterly fascinating. I feel like we're coming from this topic to such different angles and I've thoroughly enjoyed the kind of interplay. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think the, the things like the sort of moral of the story is we've just got to get much more creative about the way that we let our cities evolve and, you know, maybe just being actually really explicit about building opportunities 
especially for kids, but for all of us to be enchanted and re-enchanted with our environment. Um, you know, and play is a kind of really, you know, fun way of kind of, of putting that. So uh, I thoroughly enjoy this conversation. Thanks so much, Troy and Doc, but then especially to Auntie Caroline for kind of her, her wonderful stories that have just kind of really given me so much to think about for the rest of the evening. And I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Great. Yeah, I think um, pattern thinking is a really good point to, to finish on because it is so different. You know, we have um, these, if we wanted to kind of do a really sim a kind of a, a simplify this down to, you know, this idea that, that cities are constructed around a single point, which is a person, a singular entity, you know, the, the kind of you know, this idea of human exceptionalism, the, the idea that you are the centre of the world, whereas really this um, kind of other way of seeing the world in, in terms of pattern thinking is really just seeing yourself as a node in a network. And um, uh, uh, that's kind of really, really significant. And, and, and how you kind of reconcile those two things, I think it's an ongoing conversation. So thank you everyone for, for joining us um, as part of that conversation. And if I could ask you all to um, thank our, our speakers, our panelists. Uh,